Uh, let's do this. We're going to be in the Bible today for, for a little while. All right. So we're going to go to uh, the book of Revelation. We're studying this book right now, chapter by chapter, uh, verse by verse. We're in the uh, fifth chapter today, uh, Revelation chapter five. So you go there. As you're going there, I do see some new faces today. Uh, if you're new here and you know who you are, okay, I won't point you out or will I, okay? Um, after this service, I'd love to meet you. I'd love to give you a high five. And I got a gift for you. So this is a book that I wrote called Carve. Okay. Um, you think it's a, a Father's Day gift because of how, how thin it is. But anyways, um, I'll get one to you. Uh, and we'll meet up in the hallway uh, following, uh, following this, this service. Would love to, love to meet you. All right. Revelation uh, chapter 5. Okay. Um, Revelation can be studied in a lot of different ways. Okay. Uh, and, and so if you've been a part of four different... Revelation studies, there's four different approaches I'm sure that you have taken. As I've been talking to like newer people that are connecting with the church, I'll ask the question, have you ever studied the book of Revelation before? And nine times out of 10, I will hear, no, uh, I've always wanted to. I've always been a little freaked out by it. Okay. And let me just say, I get it. Okay. I too, like you, new people, have, have been a little freaked out by Revelation, okay? Uh, and that's not the book's fault, okay? It's the baby boomer's fault. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's the fault of bad rapture 80s movies, okay, that we, were, that we were forced to watch. I mean, I was like two when I saw that bloody guillotine fall. Sing, you know, and I was like, I will always serve to you, you know. Yes, yes, the fear of the Lord, okay? Um, yeah, yeah, pra praise God. All right. Uh, first of all, this is the book of Revelation, not the book of Revelations. So when we study the book of Revelation, we don't look for Revelations. We study it to find the revelation of the Christ, of Jesus, the Christ. All right, things are going to get a little bit wild here as we begin to study this book. We're going to get into Revelation chapter 6. As Faith was just saying, oh my goodness, next week is Pentecost Sunday. Okay, my family and I, Pastor Gail, we won't be here because we'll be in some way. Some way. My family and I will be in Africa. <laughs> so we'll be in Africa, okay? We'll be in South Africa next week. But uh, Pastor Alan <laughs> Sobakin, uh, he'll be here. Uh, I am telling you, there's a lot of churches in our country, okay? But, but the revelation that you will get from Highland Sobakin here next Sunday won't be served in any church in all of America. <laughs> I'm just making out. No, listen, if you haven't studied Pentecost from the eyes of a, of a Messianic believer, it is awesome. But not only that, about a week ago, the Lord woke up Pastor Highland and he, and he heard a roar in his spirit. He heard like the audible voice of God. He heard, Elijah! He heard Elijah. And so he said, I, I really feel like I have a word for your house. I, it, it was just amazing. Uh, we hit it off. Pastor Highland is such a theologian. Um, he's so just aware of everything happening in Israel. In fact, uh, we, we met this last week. Uh, we're going we're gonna to put together a trip to Israel. Okay, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be crazy. So don't miss, don't miss next Sunday morning. And then come Sunday night because Pastor Jonathan, it's going to be wild. But when you come back that next week, I'll actually do Revelation 6. We'll do it on the screens. Okay, we're going to get into some stuff. All right, as we get into Revelation 6, um, don't be distracted, okay, by all, this, all the imagery and everything that's taking place. Why? When you read the book of Revelation, find Christ, okay? Find Jesus. Where is Jesus at in the text? And then find yourself within the text. So when you read the book of Revelation, you should read it the same way that you watch cable news. <laughs> find Jesus. Okay, don't be distracted by all this stuff on the news. Jesus, where are you at? Jesus, what are you doing? And then Jesus, how do we function as the ecclesia, as the church in the midst of all the stuff that is taking place? Is that good? 
the way that we're approaching Revelation is there are four places in the book of Revelation where John says, I was caught up. The first one is when John is caught up and has a revelation of the seven churches. It's a letter from Jesus to seven churches. So we have, we have done that, okay? We've, we've, we've really hit on that quite a bit. You can watch that on YouTube uh, if you're new here. The second catching up takes place in Revelation chapter 4. Uh, this is pretty awesome. He says, And I looked, and behold, a door standing open, where? In heaven. And the first voice, which I had heard speaking to me, like a trumpet, said, Come up here. Okay? And what we did last week is we paralleled this, uh, Jesus speaking to John, come up here with what Moses experienced when Yahweh came upon Mount Sinai and, that, and, the, and the relational fire glory of God, okay? The fire came down on Mount Sinai, okay? And the, the people were, were, were freaking out and they sent Moses to be their mediator, to be their, um, to be their ambassador, represent them. And so Moses goes up on the mountain and God um, tabernacles with him, but he lets him know, I want to have a tabernacle on the earth. I want to have a place of encounter. I want to have a place of meeting. Why? If you were a part of our Genesis series, you'll know that since the beginning, all God has ever wanted was a home. And in the beginning, his home was on the earth, okay? And in the end, okay, this whole thing ends, okay, where? Not in heaven. This whole thing begins on the earth. So at the end of the book, the church doesn't go up. At the end of the book, heaven comes down. And there's the marriage supper of the Lamb and the restoration of all things. It's ab guys, we're going to be on such an amazing journey studying this book together all the way up until um, Christmas time. And then we'll celebrate uh, the God who became flesh, Emmanuel, Yeshua, God with us, okay? It's going to be absolutely amazing. So what, be, what, what, what happened? Okay, what happened? Okay, Moses is up. <laughs> Moses is up on the mountain. God says, I want a home. I want a place where I can tabernacle with my people. And God gives to Moses a blueprint. He gives him a, a prototype of a tabernacle which Moses is going to establish on the earth. And the tabernacle will eventually become a temple. And it's got courts and it's got a place where the general public can come. Okay, but then it's got the holy place and the holy of holies. And it's separated by two veils. You've got the Ark of the Covenant inside, okay? It's pretty, pretty amazing. You've got uh, four uh, cherubim inside the Holy, two on the Ark of the Covenant and two freestanding. So you've got, anyways, it's fascinating. What we looked at last week is when you study Revelation 4 and John gets the invitation to come up. To come up where? Into the throne room of heaven. Wow, like it's, it's amazing. When John comes up into the throne room of heaven, he begins to see the true and perfect tabernacle. He begins to see the true and perfect temple. He sees the, the original place of tabernacle that was recreated um, through uh, the Mosaic uh, tabernacle or Solomon's temple. And yet it's different. It's, you know, it, 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 in, it, in one hand, you would have a large basin, okay, where the priests would wash up and, and wash their sacrifice before going uh, into the Holy of Holies. Um, uh, you have the Ark of the Covenant, which is like the throne of God. Okay, he, uh, John is caught up into the heavens, and there's a wash basin. A place, a place, uh, it's, there's a place of baptism. There's a Red Sea to cross over from your slavery into the promised land, which is Christ. What is it? It's, 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 it's the sea of glass surrounding the, the throne. It's the throne, the Ark of the Covenant. There's not two statues of, of cherubim, okay? There, and then two freestanding. There's not four symbolic witnesses. No, there's four living creatures with six wings in the appearance like a lion, like an ox, like an eagle, like a man. Six wings, and the wings are full of eyes. You begin to see that everything that the tabernacle had, it, it's actually up in, in, in true form, in the heavens. 
And guess what? The voice of the Lord says, hey, come on up. He looks up. The door is open. Wow. When he goes up, there's no curtains separating the throne room from everybody else. Why? Because the veil is the flesh of Christ that was torn for us. So now we can freely enter in. Now, uh, and we see throne room worship, which is amazing. Okay. Uh, now, Revelation 4 and 5, they go together. So uh, this, this scroll, if you will, wasn't originally separated by chapters. So this is the same encounter. So he's caught up in heaven, the throne room, sea of glass, 24 elders, four living creatures, holy, holy, holy. Okay? It's just awesome. Heaven is happening. Okay? And yet, this isn't an eternal happening. This, this moment that John is about to be a witness of is actually a, it's a historic, heavenly um, it, reporting or encounter, and so, and, which is absolutely fascinating. John is about to witness history in heaven, okay? Remember, heaven's history is our past, present, and future. It gets forged there, and then it happens here, because heaven is reality, Amen. or heaven is for real. <laughs> it's, a, it's a book I'm, I'm, I'm working on. It's going to be cool. I feel like it's a best-selling title, so. All right. Just to clear, a heavenly occurrence. Heaven's making history. Okay? And we're going to get to see, we get to like kind of co-witness what takes place. Why? Because in Revelation chapter 5, we're going to see the revealing for the first time in the heavens. This is amazing. This is so awesome. We are going to see the revealing of the ascended lamb. We're going to see the, 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 the inauguration of the lamb that was slain. Okay? And then I want to show you the 24 elders and the transition that takes place upon the lamb, his role in heaven, and this, this transition of, of eldership that, that, that is, is, is very interesting uh, here, here. And then we're going to end with the scroll, okay? The, the famous scroll of Revelation 5. And I'm going to tell you what's in it. Ooh, okay. Only here on Eden. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, dun, dun. We'll go to a commercial break and when we come back. We'll, we'll get started. Three, two, lights. Can, all right, let's go. Revelation chapter five. Let's stand uh, for, the, for the reading of, I wish we had commercials. That'd be fun Some, someday. We'll be on Daystar. But then we'll have to like cut the service down to like 10 minutes. Because by the time you had the commercials and, all right. Part 19 of Revelation 5, right? Okay. You guys doing okay? Okay. It's, it's funny. You know, it's Mother's Day, and we have a lot of guests here today. We had a lot of guests in the first service. So, like, the logical strategic thing to do on a Mother's Day would be to keep it short, okay? Keep it short. Keep it sweet, okay? Man, we were, we were, I was just geeking out and stuff. It was like, an 80, 100-minute sermon, right? These poor people are like, Mom, can we go now, <laughs> right? So let's do it again. Here we go. Revelation chapter 5. All right. Then I saw in the right hand of him who is seated on the throne. Wow, this is Yahweh on the throne. Look at A scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals, okay? Seven completion, fullness, awesome, hallelujah. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice. Just use your imagination. See this mighty angel. He's proclaiming in all the heavens, okay? He's asking a question. Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? Imagine you're there in the heaven. You hear this mighty angel who here is worthy. And what, what would you do if an angel asked that question? You'd start looking around, right? Looking around the room. 
Are you worthy? Are you worthy? Are you who is worthy? Looking around, is there anyone here who is worthy? And look at this. And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And then one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Why? Because behold, just declare to me right now, behold. Weep no more. Why? Because behold, at this point uh, 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 in the chapter, in verse, this right here is the unveiling. This right here is the inauguration. Okay, this right here uh, is, is, is really cool and stuff. All right, here we go. Um, behold, look at the lion of the tribe of Judah. Okay, the root of David has conquered so that he can open the scroll and at seven seals. Look at verse six. Yeah, hallelujah. Okay, and between the throne and the four living creatures and amongst the elders, I saw it. Saw what? A lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns, with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who is seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, okay, this is Jesus here. When Jesus has taken the scroll, okay, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls of full of incense, which are what? The prayers of the saints. And they sang what? Not just a song. No, that's so Revelation 4. Okay, they sang a kinos song. They sang a new song. Okay, this is the kind of song that is sung in Revelation of the Lamb. The Lamb changes everything, even in the heavens. Okay, this is this is the song. Let's uh, let's 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 sing it without melody. Here we go. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain. And by your blood, you ransom people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priest to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Amen. Verse 11. And then I looked and I heard around the throne the living creatures and the elders, the voices of many angels numbering myriads and myriads, realms and realms of angels, and thousands and thousands saying with a loud voice, let's declare with them, worthy is the Lamb who is slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Amen. Verse 13, and I heard every creature, every creature, every creature, where? In heaven and on the earth and under the earth and in the sea. Blue, 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 blue. (laughs) And all that is in them saying, let's read together, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, Be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and they worship. Let's pray and and then you can be seated. Father, we honor you. We honor you and we honor the lamb that was slain before the creation of all things. We thank you, Lord, that we are included, Lord, into uh, your union. The Father, the Son, the glorious Spirit, and the Ecclesia, the Bride of Christ, the mystery of Christ. We thank you, Lord. We are alive on the earth uh, for such a time as this and a time of travailing, 
Lord, in a time of groaning, we thank you, Lord. Lord, that the sons of God are maturing. And Lord, we join in with all creation saying, even so, Lord, come, Lord Jesus, come. We love you in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. There's got to be one who is worthy. There's got to be one. There was no one, all right? And this is here going to be the revelation, okay? Uh, the revelation of, of Jesus, all right? Uh, I began to weep. I began to cry. There's no one that is worthy, okay? Uh, and here we go. This is a huge moment in heaven, okay? Everybody, you can feel the suspense, okay? Everybody's looking at each other. Everybody's looking across the room, across the throne room. Everybody's, who, okay? All right, you know, there's got to be, you know. And John, John is weeping in the encounter. John is, John is crying. There's, there's no one that is worthy to open, to open the scroll. And then all of a sudden, an elder says to him, weep no more. Why? Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has conquered so that he can open the scroll, okay, and it's seven seals. Here we go. He's a lion of the tribe, okay, ah, okay, and all of a sudden the drum started, bam, bam, ba, da, 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 da. okay, and, and you know, and, you know, the guitarists were like, how about my son on the guitar today? Wasn't that good? Yeah. That, that was my son in whom I am well pleased, right? So, you know, the gu guitarists don't show emotion, but he's just like. <laughs> uh, you know, here we go. The lion of the tribe. He is, he is the one. He is the one who has conquered, who can conquer. Okay, you know, and, and you can feel this great anticipation, okay? Uh, here he is, right? Ah, you know, ah, here, here we go. Ah, okay, um, awesome. Okay, uh, uh, you can feel the suspense. Uh, I can feel the suspense, right? Here, oh, okay, here we go. Yeah, okay, uh, and, and verse 6. And between the throne and the four living creatures among the elders. Okay, here he is. Here he is. Ah, the lion. Ah, okay. And then he looks. And what is it? A lamb. Man. Imagine this. Imagine we're at a prophetic conference. Okay, here we go. And the worship team's going, da, 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 da. Right? Here we go. Lord, Lord, Lord. Okay, and all of a sudden, a lamb comes out on the stage, and you're like, that's it? Okay, no, no, no. It's not just a lamb. Okay, um, in the Greek here, the word for lamb is a baby lamb. He looks, and he sees a baby lamb. And not just a baby lamb. It's a lamb. It's a baby lamb that has been slain. This is a big, okay, and it's not just a baby lamb that has been slain. It has seven horns, okay? And we could go, there's all kinds of symbolism here, but horns oftentimes are symbolic of the anointing, okay? And seven, fullness, completion. So here is a baby slain lamb, seven horns on him as the fullness of the anointing, on him as the fullness of the oil of heaven, and seven eyes eyes, okay? This is divine vision by the Spirit. This is Zechariah 3.9. As we talked about, uh, 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 Revelation is the book of portals, okay? And when you're reading Revelation, it begins to take you all throughout these different places. In fact, Revelation is connected to more, Revelation is the most biblical of all the books in the Bible, and that there are more references and cross-references to other texts throughout the Old Testament than any book in the Bible. And we hit here, and all of a sudden, whoo, we fly to Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 3 verse 9, see the stone I have set in front of Joshua. There are seven eyes on that one stone. And I will engrave an inscription on it, says the Lord Almighty. And I will remove the sin of the land in a single day. But John turns to see the lion and he sees a lamb. Okay, and this is where a lot of commentators begin to have a lot of fun with the text. There's something even somewhat kind of humorous about this. Okay, this is the wrath of the Lamb. 
One modern day commentator uh, called, called it, look out, here comes the wrath of Lambzilla. Okay, and all of a sudden we begin to see um, this, this, this book that was given to the early church that was living underneath the tyranny of political power, of governmental power, a church that had been victims uh, to Rome, uh, the church that has been living under severe religious oppression and political oppression. This is a church that thinks it understands power. Okay, this is a people, and they thought that Jesus was coming the first time to exercise political governmental power right we, we all we, we know what Jesus Christ will do he's gonna kick a Roman's butt or two right they were always waiting they were always waiting for Jesus to kick some Roman butt okay and Jesus is always saying you don't understand my kingdom Jesus is always saying you don't understand my power you don't understand how I rule how I reign and, and guys church we need the book of Revelation why? This book will untether us from the political governmental system that wants to define kingdom and wants to define power. Because to a great degree, we still have the same concept for success. We still have the same concept for kingdom. We have the same concept uh, of power that Rome had. Listen, true power doesn't come from Rome. True power doesn't come from, from military might. True power doesn't come from Washington, D.C., we need to hear this. Why? Because if we believe what this world tells us, we'll believe the lie that we're powerless. And we'll believe that the only kind of power is violence. But what kind of violence is this lamb going to do? Not just a lamb, a baby lamb. And not just a baby lamb, a slain baby lamb. Fascinating. This is a, a fascinating study. Uh, I'm going to read to you from one commentator um, just the last part of a quote. This is Jacob Wright. It says, The book of Revelation is relentlessly mocking the wisdom and power of this world and showing us how God wins. I'll say it like this. The book of Revelation is untethering us from the world system for might, violence, power, and success. He continues, it's not by power, it's not by might, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. This is why some theologians have called Revelation violently anti-violent. It uses traditional imagery of military triumph and subjugation, but through the irony of a little weak slain lamb. And Paul says that the cross is the power and the wisdom of God. This is foolishness to a world that believes power and wisdom is something like Caesar. Okay? Uh, power and wisdom has nothing to do with Caesar, Trump, or whoever the next fad candidate's going to be in 24 years. Okay? Bigger story than a four-year political cycle in America, my friend. Okay, he continues, but God overthrows the powers of this world. I'll, I'll say this again. God overthrows the powers of this world through a little lamb. Worthy is the lamb. Like when we read, when we read Revelation, we got to say, God, um, I always like the term blow our minds, okay? That's probably not the best term. He doesn't want to explode our heads, okay? But Lord, Lord, um, give us your revelation of who you are and the way that you operate so that we don't take the strategies of this world and put kingdom on it. Okay, so here is, here is uh, the lamb, okay? Now, what happens when the lamb is revealed Okay, uh, there's something that takes place within the 24 elders in the throne room. So we're going to look at who are the 24 elders and what takes place here um, in Roman, it, not Romans, in Revelation chapter 4 and in Revelation chapter 5. This is amazing. Okay, the lamb and his, and his inauguration in the throne room. This is the first ascended human, if you will, in the throne room. Okay? Kind of interesting. So who are the 24 elders? Okay? Um, it is believed that up until this point, the 24 elders are angelic priests. Uh, we can 
see by what they're wearing. They're wearing white robes, okay? White robes. But there's going to be a transition that takes place with the 24 elders. And with this transition are going to come a, a new grouping of elders, and they're going to be highly decorated. They're going to be known as the, be, the bejeweled ones. They're not just decorated in robes. They are decorated in jewels, okay? Still a priesthood, still surrounding the throne. All right. In Revelation chapter 4, it talks about the 24 elders, okay? And when it does, uh, let's go uh, for verse uh, 8. And the four living creatures, and each of them has six wings, day and night, um, and holy, holy, holy. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne and lives forever, the 24 uh, fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their throne, they cast their crowns before the throne saying, worthy are you, Lord. All right. In Revelation 4, when it talks about the elders... Um, that, that upon this crescendo of revelation, they fall out of their thrones and they lay their crowns down. Their crowns are symbolic of their authority. So upon this crescendo of revelation, that is going to be the fifth chapter. Because these two chapters go together, there's going to be a crescendo of revelation that is the Lamb. And upon the revelation of the Lamb, these elders are going to respond by doing what? Getting off of their thrones and taking off their crowns of authority. Okay? And at this point, at this point, there is a, 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 a heavenly succession, a heavenly transition. And uh, Peter Lightheart captures this uh, incredibly well. I'm going to read this right out of his uh, commentary. It says, John does witness a, a, a significant event. Uh, the living creatures, okay, these living angelic uh, creatures on these thrones, they prostrate themselves for the first time in Revelation 5, verse 8. And at that point, the elders cast their crowns before the throne once for Revelation 5. Describes the day when the ancient ones resign. They are never intended to occupy the thrones permanently. And the remainder of the book demonstrates that only the jeweled company of human witnesses can occupy the eternal thrones. For a little while, the bride was lower than the white-robed ones, but she has been adorned with glory and honor, a new humanity in union with the Son of Man. Given that plot development, the ancient ones are temporary counselors to the enthronement, angels rather than humans. Ancient ones, they are enthroned with the Father, the ancient one from creation, but they have grown old and are about to be replaced with a new generation, a human generation of priests, advisors, witnesses, and judges. The transition in heaven replicates the story of Israel in the wilderness. During the 40 years of wandering, the ancient ones die off and are replaced by their children. So too, during the 40 years between Jesus' death and the fall of Jerusalem, the first generation dies off to make way for a new and more mystically, the ancient heavenly rulers leave their thrones to make room for a new generation. Revelation is the story of the youthening of heaven. Heaven is where the future happens first, where the second generation, that is, human beings, take dominion so that they can latterly take dominion on the earth also, first in the heavens, then on the earth. Okay? As a newborn, Adam is under the angels. During her minority, Israel too is under guardians and managers. In Christ, humanity has grown up, ready to judge angels. What are we saying? Prior to the death, burial, resurrection, enthronement of the Lamb, you have 24 elders, okay, angelic beings around the throne, Upon the revelation of the Lamb, you see um, 24 newly appointed elders 
humans, if you will, the 12 tribes of Israel, okay, um, who were looking forward to the coming of Yeshua, okay, and the 12 apostles, okay, who their life witnessed his promise that is yes and amen, the fulfillment of Christ's coming, okay, living, dying, resurrection, and his enthronement. 24 elders, four living creatures, okay? This is a fascinating, and, and we'll look at, as we're going through the book of Revelation, okay, uh, we're going to start to get, it's going to start to mess with us. Why? We're going to see things taking place in the heavens that already took place on the earth. John is, John is going to witness, okay, the history of the earth and its origin point, the things that were catalyzed in the heavens, okay, and that were echoes on the earth. And it is, it is fascinating, yes, but it's more than that, okay? It's, it's liberating in that all of a sudden we begin to see uh, a true end times worldview for everything that is in the scriptures and a true end times worldview for the church. And I'm going to talk about what that means here in a second. So, what do we have so far? We've got the lamb, okay? Wow. That's, that's the picture of power. The picture of power is the slain baby lamb, okay? Incredible. We see the succession of the, of the elders, right? And now let's look at the scroll, okay? It says here, And I saw on the right hand of him who is seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, Sealed with seven seals. Okay, we're going to get into the seven seals. Okay, but the, the, uh, a scroll, okay, would be sealed. Are you ready for this? By seals. <laughs> Write that down. Okay, the seal is not the letter. The seal is not the data. The seal is not the revelation in and of itself. The seal is the wax that's melted, okay, on the scroll to protect the scroll, to keep somebody from tampering with the scroll. You would have a king with a, with a, with a signet ring who would use his ring to, to seal a scroll, okay? Um, so we're going to be looking at the seals, okay? But what is in the scroll, okay? Um, uh, uh, so a, a scroll is written on the back. Uh, 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 verse 6, uh, he sees the lamb. Okay, verse 7, and, and the lamb goes. Yeshua goes. Jesus goes. And he takes the scroll from the right hand of him who is seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. And they began to worship with the kainos song, with the new song, uh, the song of the lamb. What, is, what does he take? Okay, he takes, he takes, the scroll that belongs to him. This is the scroll of the Lamb. This is, are you right? This is the, this is the heavy revy. Okay, this is, this is the revelation that, that we can so for, you know, never, okay? This is beautiful. This is awesome. This is holy. Jesus, he takes the scroll. What is the scroll? Tell me what's in the scroll. My friends, the scroll is the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy. He is the ancient of days. He gets to read the scroll. He is aware of what's in the scroll, and so are you and I. In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning was the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, the three in one, okay? And the Father, Son, and Spirit said, let there be light, and there was light. There was all of creation. And then they said, let us make man in our own image and likeness. There's the creation of Adam, and God breathes into the nostrils of Adam, and he gives them a mandate to be fruitful and multiply and to subdue the earth. And then, is, then comes Genesis chapter 3, and mankind falls and rebels against God. But there in Genesis chapter 3, okay, is the promise that through the seed line of the woman would come forth the Redeemer would come forth a Messiah, would come forth Yeshua. And then from that point forward, the prophets are declaring. Uh, we get to see the dynasty of David, okay? We get to see uh, all of the Psalms, and we get to see Solomon and the songs, uh, the song of Solomon. And, and here, is, here is this phenomenal record until one starry night. A uh, shepherds are 
doing what shepherds do, watching their flock by night, when all of a sudden a host of heaven appears. It says, for unto you is born this day in the city of David. Messiah is here. God has become flesh. He is here to dwell among man. Jesus lives, okay? Jesus models the kingdom. Jesus preaches the gospel of the kingdom. Jesus lives. He dies. He resurrects. He ascends. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He sent his glorious Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ Jesus, to come and to occupy the church. We see the mobilization of the church. We see the church commission to go into all the world to make disciples of nations, okay? And then we see a, a, a catching up, if you will, a, a moment where those who haven't received their glorified bodies get upgraded. And then all of a sudden comes down the new and heavenly uh, Jerusalem. And then we see the lion and the lamb, the marriage supper of the lamb, the restoration of all things. We see this thing ends the way that it begins in harmony and union, the tabernacle of God on the earth with his family. This is incredible. Who would write a story like that? Th that's what this is? You mean we're in the book? Yeah, we're in the book. We're in the part of travail. We're in the part of travail. We're all of creation saying, this is not the way it ought to be. The crying out for the restoration of all things. And here is the body of Christ, the, the mystery of Christ, the ecclesia. And what, is, what does the Lamb have? The Lamb has the entire storyline of his testimony. It is the testimony of the Lamb. It is, it, is, it is the book, if you will, the book of the Lamb. It is his Lamb. It is his book. It is his scroll. And guess what? If you are in him, you are a new creation. You are a new kainos. You are a new song. You have a new song because of the lamb that was slain and not only that but your scroll is in his scroll your name is written in the lamb's book in the lamb's scroll guess what this is the scroll is the is is the gospel of the cosmos the ancient of days that before the formation of the world the lamb was slain This, my friends, is the end times. You say, what are you talking about? I thought the end times was when we all have to get a chip in our forehead or in our hand. And the only way to purchase anything is if you have a microchip in your hand or your forehead. Well, that'll never happen. You'll never have to show any sort of card or something to eat at a restaurant. Right? That, that, that there, you know, this is the end time. No, the end times is, is, is the Antichrist, okay? The, the end times is, is the rapture, okay? The, that's the, no, no, no. Not biblically. The, the end times is the restoration of all things. The family of God no longer divided. No longer a duplex upstairs and downstairs, okay? No longer having to decide, do I do Christmas at mom's or dad's? All the effects of sin, all the effects of generational shatteredness completely resolved because of the justice of the cross as all of creation, as all of the cosmos is engulfed in the redemption message of the lamb who is slain. What does that mean? That has radical, think about this for a second. That has radical implications on your worth, your value, your, Id your identity, and your destiny. Why? The world says you get your value based off of your performance, okay? So it's, if you are going to invest in Apple, okay? Um, it's been a, a kind of a rough season for Apple, okay? Uh, the Chinese are buying other phones first. So Apple's now the number three or number four uh, phone. That's not good. Why? There's a lot of Chinese people in China, okay? And the iPhone isn't their favorite phone. What does that mean? Uh, Apple's performance isn't that good right now. What does that mean? They're not as valuable, <laughs> okay? When, when you don't perform, you're not as valuable. That's the way this world works. If you don't perform, you're not valuable, okay? Sucks to be you. You're lame, okay? You're not valuable. That stinks, okay? The, and <laughs> yeah, all right, cool. Have a good day. Happy Mother's Day. All right. 
the world system, the way that that works is it works from the past to the present. That's where your value comes from. Your performance is judged based off of your past to your present. Our kingdom is not of this world. We do not operate according to a Kronos, Kronos timeline. Okay? That's called worldly wisdom. Wisdom accumulated by time. Paul talks about this to Corinth. Worldly wisdom. Okay? We are not to operate according to that wisdom. Why? We operate from a wisdom from above, which is so far above, it operates above time and space, which is why John's um, encounter and revelation, you have all of time in a circle, and John is, is, is being probed into different parts of time and seeing how it corresponds with heavenly realities and, see, and seeing how it engages the earth, and he gets the big picture that way. All right, so if that is the case, okay, if we operate according to wisdom from above, that doesn't operate from a, from a timeline, that means that our value is not determined based off of performance from the past to the present. What does that mean? It means from the God who is above time, he knows the end of the story from the beginning of the story. What does that mean? It means that my value is determined from the future to the present. It, uh, no, no. But wait, there's more. <laughs> and it's not based off of my works from the future to the present. It's based off of the finished work of the cross from the future to the present. Check it. He who knew no, you like that? That was hip. Check it. He who knew <laughs> no sin, he in his perfection, became all of your sin, all of my sin, so that we could become all of his righteousness. All right, this is how people like to do it, okay? Are, are you messed up? Are you jacked up? Does nobody like you? Does everybody hate you? Are you suicidal? Are you, just, are you just done? Okay, awesome. Here's what we need to do. We need to take you back to the past, okay? And rework through this and rework through that, and, okay? And, you know, okay? Your, your, your daddy dropped you, your mom, uh, okay, uh, okay, uh, you know, you're there. okay, awesome. And we'll work through it. It's going to take, it's going to take what? It's going to take what? It's going to take time. But what if you didn't have to go through all of that? What if the end you was already determined? What if the finished work of the cross uh, already spoke for you? What if your performance and your value was so rooted in the cross, your perfection was already intact, you were already seated with Christ Jesus in heavenly places? You know what you should do? You should, well, what's the 100-year goal here, right? What's the 200-year goal here? All right, we'll start there. And, you know, if you're going to build things that last, if you're going to build a corporation that lasts, you're going to need to have a five-year goal. And then what you do is you use your imagination and you look out five years and you work your way back. That makes sense, doesn't it? Nobody's ever going to say to you, find out where you were five years ago <laughs> and work your way forward. Who does that? Nobody does that. If you're going to build a kingdom, go back 25 years ago and, and work your, yourself. No, no, no. Here's what we do. We go to the end of the book, the restoration of all things, the marriage supper with the Lamb, and we say that's the picture of justice. This is the picture of mercy. This is the picture of the kingdom of God. This is what the earth should look like. This is what marriage should look like. This is what finance should look like. This is what entertainment should look like. And by the way, Revelation, pretty entertaining, is it not? This, this is what beauty should look like. This is what purity should look like. And it is intact and it is final. My friends, it is finished and it is already done. What the end times is, it's not when everything hits the fan. It's not when black choppers start hovering over your house and make you get a marker or, or a Starbucks app. No, the end times is the restoration of all things, okay? And we begin there and we work our way back. That means I am 100% righteous. I am 100% whole. But what about, what about sanctification? Isn't sanctification the process that takes time? Isn't that what we've been taught? Holiness takes time. And what we have to do is we got to work through our, all our soul trash, okay? Dive into the old soul dumpster, okay, and start pulling everything out. 
okay? Sanctification takes time. Well, the word means set apart. And when were you set apart? Your setting apart doesn't take time. That's immediate. That is final. And when we are in him, we identify ourselves. That means he is our identity. So Christianity is not the lifelong attempt to discover who you really are, boo. I just want to know who I am. Come to our school. We'll teach you who you are. It might take three years. It might take five years. Maybe forget you and behold him. Behold him and you'll be like him. The goal isn't for you to be more like the, the true you, <laughs> whoever the true you is. <laughs> Okay, I've been saved for however long. I've been, I don't know, okay. I, have, I haven't a clue who I am. And I'm not bothered by it, really. Why? Because I know who he is. I want to know who he is. People say, Darren, you can't do that. That's not who you are. Say, you don't even know who I am. Why? Because I don't even know who I am, but I know who he is. I know who he is. I know where he is. I know what he is. Don't put me in your little box, in your little identity box, or your little apostle box. If he says I can do it, I can do it. Okay? I want to be of his world, not our small-minded, charismatic world. Hallelujah? We're going to do some stuff. We're going to do some wild stuff. Why? Because we're going to be around a while. Why? Because we are eternal beings, and if you believe in me, you will not die, but you will have everlasting life. What a glorious gospel. What a glorious good message. You can't save yourself. You can't make yourself holy. Okay? You might be able to make yourself a little more likable, and that could go well for you. Okay? But you can't make yourself righteous. You can't make him love you. He loves you so much. The Father sent his only begotten Son so that if you would believe in him, you would not perish, but you would have what? You would have what? Guys, this is the study of eternal life. This is the study of the eternal God. This is the study of the word that bums us out. We don't even like to talk about eternity, but eternity is for real. Heaven is for real. These are, these are the authentic realms that have carved out our own, and we should obsess over it. We should have, I was just thinking about the scroll, the, how holy, how holy his scroll is, and the record. It, it, it's, you know, we think of the gospel, and again, we only think of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We don't think that this entire book is the gospel from Genesis all the way to Revelation. It is the story of the true and perfect hero. And the, and the superhero just so happens to be a wounded baby lamb. Oh. God is good, amen? Man, I'm telling you, it's a good time to be a Christian. I sure wouldn't want to not be one. You know what I'm saying? Too much to, imagine trying to figure out all this nonsense without the blueprint. Pretty amazing. Like, who knew all this stuff was here, right? Who knew that there'd be days like this? Isn't it wild? Man, it, it'd sure be a good time to have a good GPS so that you're on mission. You're living life intentionally. Yeah? Is that good? Yes. Hallelujah. Love you guys. I think you're awesome. Love you mamas. Yep, yep, yep. All right, let's get you out of here. Why don't you jump up to your feet? I'm going to bless you here. Okay. Um, for those without moms, we'll be back tonight at our 6 o'clock service. <laughs> Thanks, Patty. Also, don't leave because we're going to do communion. I got y'all excited, but uh, we're going to be back here at 6 o'clock tonight. Robert, you better run like the wind, buddy. Yes. Can we get him a communion cup? Somebody just launch one, Adam. We're going to be back here tonight at, at our 6 o'clock service uh, for our glory service. How many of you were here last Sunday night for the glory service? H how, how fun was that, huh? Check it out. We had a woman that was here with severe cartilage um, injury in her knee, and God just totally healed her knee just during worship. Isn't that cool? 
Her mom was here, had uh, arthritis in her neck that was limiting her movement in her neck. And her mom got healed of arthritis without anyone even praying for her. And so she got full movement in her neck. So she got her knees, knees healed and her mom got her neck healed on the, same, on the same service. Isn't that cool? It's always good when you leave church with less pain. Because how many of you ever left a church with more pain? Just me? Okay. <laughs> Just to clear me right now, worthy is the lamb. Wow, who is slain? Do it again. Just say, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. On the, on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body that is broken for you. Take and eat and remembrance of me. This is the body of the Lord. This is the veil that was torn. This is his flesh that was ripped open so you and I could have access to his throne room. Let's partake of the bread together. And in the same way, after dinner, he took the cup and he said, this cup is my blood. Take it and drink it. <laughs> and do it often. For as often as you do, you are declaring this new covenant reality, this, this new epoch moment. You are declaring a new system of grace that has replaced and demolished an old system of works. Take it, drink it, bring it into you. Let it transform you from the inside out. For in doing so, you are declaring the Lord's death until he comes again. Jesus is coming again, amen? Let's partake of the blood together. Let's do this. Let's just declare this together. Just declare with me right now. It is finished. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If we could have our prayer ministry team come. Uh, if you need prayer today, you need healing, you need encouragement, blessing, we've got all the time in the world. So come on up. We'd love to pray with you, stand with you. Otherwise, if you're new here, don't forget to say hi. I'll be out in the hallway. Uh, and also, don't forget to come back tonight. Otherwise, you are loved and highly favored. God bless you.